I'll tell you, we had another wedding yesterday, and I'm just blessed by the, I'm seeing couples that want to do things right, um, desiring to uh, step out and commit to one another in this way, and then children being brought to church, and um, just, it's so great, and it's not, here's the beauty of it, it's not because these young people, young men and young ladies are falling into line to what we think should be done, that they're pursuing Christ on their own. And I'm just so blessed by these married couples, these single parents, these children being brought to church, these individuals that are um, dedicating their children um, because that's the start of the steps that I think honor God to say, we, God, we need help. And, uh, and then ultimately, that little baby grows up and then pursues um, Christ. And uh, I just, I'm blessed by it. And so I'm, I'm grateful for what God's doing in the lives of our young people. So let's pray as we're starting out um, this morning and uh, look to what the Lord wants to teach us here. Father, thank you that you made your word so interesting that you put in it not just lists of things. It wasn't just a grocery list that we put into our pocket and we head off to the store, but it is, um, it's in the midst of stories you tell and give us principles and truths, but ultimately then you remind us, oh, that's right, we have a hero named Jesus that shows up and makes all these things possible. So, so thank you for it. Thank you for this, this young man that, as Bill was talking about, that ultimately grows up named Joseph, and he gives us such an, an idea of what your son was like. Uh, rejected by his brothers, um, born to greatness, loved by the Father, lavished love on him. Um, then he goes through suffering and pain, but ultimately is risen to sit at the right hand of the ruler and uh, saves people, saves lives, and then is a forgiving individual. We're going to see that this morning here as we look at this story again. So, Father, would you help us as we're working through this and that we cannot, some of the things that people do to us, we cannot with our intellectual mind forgive them because... We think about it all the time. We just can't turn our brain off with that. And so we can, uh, I've seen this so many times recently, even with young people that um, are distant from here, that I'll hear stories about some pain that's happened to them, and they're still holding on to it. I'd ask you that we wouldn't be doing that and that we could forgive and, and let go because we're in bondage if we hold on to that stuff. So God, would you help us this morning to get this story? and that the Spirit of God would um, do some surgery and uh, help us with that, because left to ourselves, we just keep, we're smart enough to rationalize away vengeance and, and uh, bitterness. So God help us, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to show you some verses here on forgiveness, because I think it's a thing that we need. I don't know about you. I never grow tired of the topic because I know I'm, I'm in need of it. But Matthew six fourteen and 15 says this. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Wow, that's, that's pretty telling when you think about that. First uh, John 1, 9 if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And 1 John is a letter that um, looks at what the Christian life is like, and it's a confessing life. It's a, it's a forgiving life. 2 Corinthians five seventeen. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And Colossians 1, 13 and 14. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. 
And then lastly, and this is a beautiful picture, Psalm 103, uh, 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. And it's so interesting that the psalmist, under the inspiration of God, knew and understood that um, if he made it a north-south thing, that if you separate them, well, ultimately, if you go north completely, at some point you're going to go south. But with east, if you keep heading east, you will always keep heading east. If you head west, you'll always head west. Um, and so he understood that that's the separating power of um, the forgiveness of sins that God has done. Well, let's look at this story uh, today. If you want to take notes, there's a section in your bulletin to do that. But remember where he's been. Jacob has died. He's, he's drawn up his feet into the bed. He's breathed his last, and he's gathered to his people. Uh, point number one, we see preparation. We see preparation. Look at verse 1 again with me, or for the first time. We'll, we'll read through the scripture as we work through it together. Then Joseph fell on his father's face and wept over him and kissed him. The depths of emotion. Um, he fell on his father's face. He wept over him. He kissed him. He loved his dad. I don't know if you've ever had this happen where somebody that you love has died. And I know I've mentioned this to you before, but back in November of 1990, uh, my father died. And I was actually in central Illinois at the time. He was, he's a machinist. My dad worked 50 years as a machinist. And uh, he was talking with a guy actually about lottery numbers. Boy, that was the depth of my father's conversation half the time. And uh, he's talking about numbers with this guy, and he has a heart attack and collapses there, and they tried to get him his nitroglycerin pill, and it just wasn't quick enough, but he dies. And so I get news of this when I'm in central Illinois. And um, I, um, Kim and I, you know, get packed up and bring the kids up, and, and uh, we're... Uh, we get there, and you sleep, and then the next morning you meet at the funeral home. And uh, I had not, so you, you know, you hear somebody dies that you love, but you don't, you don't see them. So you, you believe it because these people that you trust tell you this, but until I saw my dad, I didn't know for sure. And I remember um, going in to the, the funeral home and in the basement there where um, he's laying there and seeing him and it hitting me, the reality of it. And then seeing his hands. And these are the hands that when you're a little kid, you know, you think about holding your dad's hand. I remember even as a little child, him reaching and holding my hand to cross the streets in Chicago. And the care there and how much these hands worked so that I could eat and have a house and and uh, live and but I remember seeing his hands and reaching out and touching his hands and the coldness of death it's not room temperature even it is cold and it hit me and you just you weep because you love your dad you want you know you, this is your dad this is this is your mom. This is, this is this person that means so much to you. And the reality hits. And I remember, and just that compassion, uh, the time that my father-in-law passed away, which is November again of 95. And the time that this, that, that it hit me the most during the funeral service, I'm sitting there, and my brother-in-law, the big Samoan guy, he's this huge Samoan guy, and he's just all, he's one of those gentle giant kind of guys where just a tender heart, you'd, you'd, you would all love him, okay, trust me. He's one of those entertaining uh, jokes that are really bad, but everybody laughs because they all love him, you know, that kind of guy. And he's but a tender, tender, compassionate guy, and he goes up, and he touches the hand of my father-in-law, and I just lose it because it brought me back to that with my dad, but it also the reality of this happens. People die. People die that we love. And so I'm constantly trying to beat that drum to say, please, if there's something that is between you and somebody else, um, 
Get that worked out. No regrets. Pursue um, reconciliation. Pursue forgiveness. Um, try. Because this is the reality that, that this, this is going to happen. And so you see here this, this, this young man who now his daddy has died. And he just loves him, loves him, loves him, loves him. Let's, let's look at verse 2 and 3. And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. So the physicians embalmed Israel. Forty days were required for it. Boy, these Egyptians were thorough, weren't they? Uh, for that, and I mean, you think about, I don't know if you've ever been at a field museum for us, when the King Tut um, uh, exhibit came in, through Chicago. And I remember even like, I think, fifth or sixth grade, we're all going to go, you know, even Steve Martin made a song about good old King Tut, you know, and uh, is just making his way through America. But we are blessed to see something archaeologically because of these people who had skill in this area. Joseph is surrounded by these guys. And for his dad, he's going to have the care of his dad's body taken this way. And so, so 40 days were required for it. Uh, that is how many are required for embalming. And look at this. And the Egyptians wept for him 70 days. He calls these medical men that are fully capable of embalming. And he's probably not looking to the ones that are going to make it a religious thing. Um, he's going to make it so that it's just the care for his father's body. And um, so the, the, the gutting it, the embalming, the drying it, the wrapping it, but ultimately um, his dad is going to be taken care of this way. So first of all, we see preparation. Point number two we see permission. We see permission. Look at verse 4. And when the days of weeping for him were past, isn't that interesting how God tells us even how long we should grieve? It's kind of like he's, he's, send, he's sharing something with us about that there is a length for us as, you know, you could look at this customarily, but it seems to be that God's also teaching us. Because we grieve, but not like those who have no hope. And so we'll see them again. And so he says, And when the days of weeping for him were past, Joseph spoke to his household, to the household of Pharaoh, saying, If now, I love this, he's like realizing or he's making them aware, now I've kind of done some good stuff for you. You know, scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. If now I have found favor in your eyes, please speak in the ear, ears of Pharaoh, saying, My father made me swear, saying, I am about to die in my tomb that I have hewed out for myself in the land of Canaan. There shall you bury me. Now, therefore, let me please go up and bury my father. Then I will return. Verse 6. And Pharaoh answered, Go up and bury your father as he made you swear. So at the appropriate time, he's enlisted Pharaoh's um, men to obtain the king's permission to bury his father in Canaan. And he wisely appealed to the sympathies of the king, um, recalling Jacob's wish. He's going back to, this is my dad wanted, and you knew my dad, and I think you liked my dad. And, and uh, he points to the oath made to his father, and so... Pharaoh agrees. Pharaoh, the, the people that even aren't believers understand familial love. I've done funerals for all different types of families. And every family loves their family. They don't need to be people that believe, or just people that believe in Christ. And they, their heart goes out. I guarantee you, you watch a movie and it moves people, um, you don't look around and go, oh, only the Christians were crying. Everybody in that theater is touched. So he pursues that and he, and he takes advantage of that opportunity in a good way. Point number three, we see procession. We see procession. Look at verse 7. So Joseph went up to bury his father. 
With him went up all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his household and all the elders of the land of Egypt, as well as the, all the household of Joseph, his brothers, and his father's household. Only their children, their flocks, and their herds were left in the land of Goshen. And there went up with them, both with him, both chariots and horsemen. It was a very great company. And so the word all speaks uh, this entourage that uh, traveled with Jacob's body for burial. And um, the chariot was uh, military um, expertise of the Egyptians. And it says how much that Pharaoh was in line with what uh, Joseph was doing, that he would allow him all of this pomp and, and circumstance to allow uh, this all to come together. Verse 10, when they came to the threshing floor of Atad, which is beyond Jordan, they lamented there with a very great and grievous lamentation. And he made a mourning for his father seven days. When the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the mourning on the threshing floor of Atad, they said, this is a grievous mourning by the Egyptians. Therefore, the place was named Abel Mizraim. It is beyond the Jordan. Thus his sons did for him as he had commanded them. For his sons carried him to the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave at the field of Machpelah to the east of Mamre, which Abraham bought with the field from Ephraim the Hittite to possess as a burying place. And so for ten, seven days at a place for mourning, there's this lamenting going on, this collective lamenting is going on, and the Egyptians even mourn him. And the sons were completely involved in the burial of their father. I, I like seeing this. I, as I've mentioned before, when I'm doing funerals, it's so good to be able to sit with family members, and they just have great memories usually. I don't think I've ever sat through one. I've heard some pastors tell about some family members that did not like the person that died. They could care less of how those things are handled. That's very rare. Usually, in those circumstances, they have great memories. And so even with, at, with all that had happened, you've got the Reubens and the Judas and the Simeons and the Levi's and Issachar's and Naphtali and Dan and Gad, and they're all sitting there, and they're all part of the process because they all love their father. Verse 14. After he had buried his father, Joseph returned to Egypt with his brothers and all who had gone up with him to bury his father. So twice is mentioned the burial of their father, and the, the redundancy reflects the magnitude of the event. But I find it interesting that at some point, Joseph returns to Egypt. He doesn't stay there. It, goes, it points back to the fact that he understands his calling. He understands that he's got a job to do. At some point, we got to get back to life. This is an important thing to remember because in the midst of what these, this pain that goes on, um, it's, sometimes it's very difficult, but at some point, um, mourning needs to turn to gladness or mourning needs to turn to uh, the reality of life. Last point, we see pardon. And this is, this is the crux of the matter. This is a huge, huge part of the book of Genesis. And I hope you've enjoyed Genesis it seems like um, this is an old friend, this is, uh, and it's been tough at times as we work through this, this whole book together. I mean, we're talking uh, close to two years of messages, and um, as we've been doing it, we've seen the best and the worst out of people. We also see a family here that is a family of believers, and so... You and I have, I would hope, believe, families that are believing, and I hope that this makes you feel pretty good about your family, uh, that as you look at this, you go, man, fam believing families that can be messed up. Hey, welcome to church, okay? Welcome to real life. But we see a part in here that needs to be done, and I love how it's almost like a bow is tied at the end of this present of Genesis that's been given to us. But we all need to hear it. So look at um, verses 15 and 16 of chapter 50 with me here under We See Pardon. 
When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father gave this message before he died. Now, do you, real, do you realize how powerful guilt is? But parents, you, do, you know how powerful guilt is. You've used this, this skill with your kids. I don't know if you ever had that. My, my, my oldest figured it out at a certain point where I would go, he'll come home, and it's just been a decent day, but he'd walk through the door, and those of you that know Justin know the, the look that you get. He had this look, and I would always go, so what happened? And he'd just look at me, what? And I go, what happened? Just tell me, because we've already heard what happened, but we'd like to hear your side of it. And in the early years, he'd confess. But as time go, went by, he knew that we didn't know. There were times we did know, but because you do have sources everywhere. As parents, we do. They aren't paid, but you know they, they are sources that we, we get stuff off of. But, I would <laughs> but at a certain point, he would go, nothing, and he, he had nothing for me. But in those early years when he would fess up, the reality is guilt hit him, and he knew uh, something was up. And so this death of Jacob brought out feelings in the brothers, and they were trying to engineer events that benefited them. Now, have you ever done that? Have you ever had guilt for something, and you're trying to head this off at the pass? You're, you're trying to work it out so that you have the best case scenario for you. And so they feel guilt, and they get together, and they go, Man, we did all this stuff, and they don't realize he's forgiven them. So we gotta, we got to create this story, and we'll use what he loves. Dad. Look at verses 17 and 18. Say to Joseph, so he says, your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, Please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. So Joseph, Joseph this is what dad said. This is what he wanted. We, we're, we, you know, we understand how we are and stuff, but Daddy wanted this, and they are begging. Now think about this. Why is Joseph crying? I think he's crying because he knows they're lying. I think he's crying because didn't they believe him the first time? Didn't they trust him? See, he knows they're lying because Joseph loved his dad. And Joe, um, because he had been away from his dad for so long, was probably with him all the time that he could be. And just the idea of his brothers having a conversation outside of him being around with their dad would be perplexing to him. Like, there's things about my brothers my dad didn't even like, and he liked me, and he would have told me this. Dad would have told me this because we have that kind of relationship. And so they have this secret conversation without him, and so they engineer they connive, they work this story up, and all it does, and by the way, he cries a lot. He's at a point in his life, he's just, I, I can see as, he, as he's gotten older, it just keeps hitting him more and more, all of these different things. And so he could look like a crybaby, but I think that's what's happened over the years with him. He has become a person that's very, very tender. And so he's crying. And they see this, and that probably even freaked them out even more. And so they cast themselves at his feet, and they realize how powerful he is. 
And I want you to look at his response. And it goes back to what Bill said. He had ultimate power. He could have crushed them. But look at what, look what, look how he responds. And this is a good, good word for us. He says, verse 19, But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? See, in their minds, he, they, he is. He, he can crush them. He can kill them. He can take them out. But he knows that he's not in control of history. That's a proper perspective. And I don't care how much power you and I have, we should never, ever make somebody feel this way. There should never be this kind of manipulation. Parent to child, um, vice versa, spouses toward one another. No matter how much somebody has done to make them feel so subservient that they feel this way. The only one that is reserved to have that kind of worship is, is our Savior Christ. But look at this. This is the verse. This is, the, this is it. This is the climax. This is the, this is the key section of Scripture here, verse 20. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Wow. We just got done watching uh, in our Sunday school class uh, the reason for God. Uh, this is the section. Why do? Why is there suffering? Why is there pain? And and this is a huge discussion going on today. A huge thing of if God is so loving and all powerful, why would He allow this? Because He must not be very loving, or He changed that, or or He must not be very powerful. So why is that the case? And Joseph, in one verse, answers the question. What you, brothers, meant for evil, God meant for good. Somebody had to suffer. Somebody had to go through something to get to this point. You could say, well, he could have. I think God was even working on Joseph in ways to teach him some things about favoritism and to teach him some things about braggadociousness. He had to break him to the point where he was going to be a servant to be used. And and he saw this. He, He looked back on this and he was able to say, oh, that's why I was thrown in the pit. Oh, that's why I was sold as a slave. Oh, that's why I was in this guy's house and Somebody lied about me, like you're lying to me right now. And that's why I was then thrown into a prison. And then I had guys that dreamed dreams, and I had dreamed dreams, and I, I interpreted them because I think, and I, got, I think I got it right because ultimately I, you guys did bow down to me. And then those guys told me about Pharaoh or told me about their dreams, and one of them dies, and then the one that lives and is exalted, he ultimately remembers about me. And then I'm brought in to interpret a dream again, but I'm not the one who does that. It's, it's God that gives the power to do that. And so we look at this and we see, wow, so right now in your life, whatever that thing is that's going on, you could have people, even in your family, orchestrating things that are evil. And they mean it for evil against you. But God. And I want to tell you, those two words, but God, those may be the two words that carry you through a bunch of stink going on in your life. Does that excuse them? No. They, they are held accountable for that. But God. And even then, these get forgiveness. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So what, what's going on with your life right now? I don't know. Some of you I do, but many I don't. Is there something going on? Or it just, just 
doesn't feel right or it doesn't seem right. And if your Heavenly Father is your Heavenly Father, He's aware. And bad, bad sometimes happen for good reasons. And I don't want to be trite. And I don't want to be the guy quoting at the funeral, all things work together for good to those that are called. But the verse is in the Bible. And Romans 8, 28 leads to the good being that you would be conformed to the image of his son. That's the good. Last verse for today, verse 21. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. So I want to encourage you as people that there will be times where people don't understand you. They won't even get it when you're being kind toward them. They won't get that. But you keep speaking kindly to them. Keep assuring them. Keep talking to them truth from the word.